<laughs> so commission rules and regulations. This you already know. License law and rules says a salesperson may not accept any form of compensation except from broker. His broker. His broker. His or her broker. Of um, record. So every time you see broker in the book, it talks about the broker of record. Because if it's a broker salesperson, you'll explicitly say broker salesperson. So every time you see broker, you got to remember it's your broker the sponsoring book. In the exam, it's very important to know the difference. So it says a salesperson may not maintain an escrow account or hold funds belonging to others. Nope. Right? I'm going to talk about escrow accounts later. And a salesperson cannot work for more than one New Jersey broker at a time. So how many brokers can you work for? One. No. Nope. Two, technically, right? Technically, two. What do you mean? Because you can go for a referral, their broker goes to your broker, to you, no? You don't, work, you don't work for that broker that you refer to. Hmm. New Jersey and New York. New Jersey and New York, two brokers. And there's another 48 states that you can work on. Okay. So you can work for 50 brokers, just in the United States alone. You want to work in Portugal, you want to work in Spain, different brokers. The thing is, if the question specifically states New Jersey, then you can only work for one New Jersey broker at a time. You cannot work for Wyckoff and Remax, or Remax and Remax. Because Remax, we have Remax of Westfield, Remax of Cranford, and so on. You can only work for one broker. That's your broker of record. Record. You got to remember, broker of record. Place of business. There's main office, and then there's branch offices. I'm going to address both at the same time because almost the same thing. It says every broker who is a resident of New Jersey must maintain a place of business in the state. Now, because it says every broker, you're talking about the broker of record. Why is this important again? Because a broker salesperson does not need to have their own office. But if it's a broker of record, they must have an office. Now, to help you with costs, the New Jersey Real Estate Commission allows you to have it in your own home. So it says right there, if your office is in your broker's own home, the only condition is that you have a separate area with its own entrance visible from the street. Uh -huh. And you cannot see it, but it's in green over here. Like, extra important. Uh, so, visible from the street. So, if you have an office in the basement, is it okay? Why not? Because it's invisible. What is not visible? The office or the entrance? The entrance. The well, the office, the office, I'm sorry, the office. But the entrance is the only thing that must be visible from the street. The entrance. The entrance is the key. Okay. Oh, okay. The other question is, um, can the, the office be in, like, the living room? No. Yeah. Not happening. Because it's inside. Well, no, depending. Where the... No, no, no. It has to be separate from the living space. Okay. Cannot be connected. So the living room cannot be the waiting room. It has to be completely separate. Okay. So you can live on the second floor or right over there, and this is completely separate. It's separate access, separate doors, separate everything. Okay. okay, we cannot mix the space, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is not convenient. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you know what? <laughs> All right. It says that <laughs> your office can never be in the home of a broker's associate. So if I'm the broker of record and you guys work with me, you're my associate. You have a, a, a great space for us to do an office. Sorry, can you use it? Okay? It's either in my home or in a commercial setting. That's it. Um, it says the broker's name and the words licensed real estate broker must be conspicuously displayed on the exterior. What's it again? Not the best. Let me test. <laughs> we already covered roughly 30 questions of the exam. But <laughs> here's the thing conspicuously displayed. Why? Before you walk into that office, you must know who you can sue in case the salesperson screws up your deal. All right? Because the broker of record is the one responsible for the salesperson. So right before I walk in, okay, licensed real estate broker is this person. Great. If you screw up, I'm suing your broker. And you. You got it? So it must be on the exterior. It says the license of the broker and those of any associates to be proudly displayed in the main office. Same thing with the branch office. You got to go to the next page. It says that the main, op uh, main office and the person's working in it must be under the full-time direct supervision of either a broker, I mean the broker, or a qualified broker salesperson. What does that mean? It means that 
you cannot be a supervisor, you cannot be a supervisor, you cannot be a supervisor, we cannot be supervisors. Only the broker of record must be there or another broker salesperson that you can say, hey, you're, you have experience, you gotta be responsible for that. Office managers cannot tell the agents what to do unless they're licensed, experienced, like broker salespeople courses. You got it? Very important. Branch office, it's exactly the same thing as the main office, except it cannot be in somebody's home. It has to be in a commercial setting. That's the first thing. Second thing, it talks about the licenses. See, the main office, the main office, the main office must hold every license. Nowadays, it's digital, but back in the day, you have a wall of things where all the realtors were listed. Okay? I mean, all the salespeople were listed. Come on in. I let you out, bro. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Corner with like a little hat. Yes. He's all right. Um. So what I was saying is that the, all the, the licenses must be listed on that wall, right? But the main office you list the licenses for the main office and for the branch offices. At the branch office, you list the license of the people that work in that office. Let's say this is a branch office. We, we tell the real estate commission that we're the ones that work in this office. But our license must be also at the main office, wherever it is. You got it? Yeah. And also under direct supervision of a broker or qualified broker. Next, we have trust account or escrow account. Has anybody ever heard of this? Trust account or escrow accounts? Well, what does that mean? Escrow is basically they give you a number while you paying your insurance. Yeah, what is it? Active. You think about mortgages. Oh, yeah, right. So, no. It operates the same way. Okay. The same way in escrow account. But for this, it's for a real estate transaction. Once you're done with a real estate transaction, there's escrow for tax insurance and all that. And so on. In this case, I want you to write OPM. That's my favorite drug. OPM. It's other people's money. So, when we talk about escrow accounts, we're talking about other people's money. See, the one you're talking about is still other people's money because that money you're putting there just to pay the insurance and taxes does not belong to the bank. So that's why they keep it separate. Okay. In this case, in every real estate transaction, we have somebody that gives a deposit. That deposit cannot go to the broker's account. We're going to go over that in a second. That deposit must go into a separate account because it's not the broker's money. It's somebody else's money. You got it? That's why it says used for the deposit of all money belonging to other persons. This escrow account, so the name of the financial institution and the account number must be reported to the commission, both at license application and time of renewal. You have to let them know, hey, if anything happens, this is where the money is. Attorneys do the same thing. They have their, their older account where if anything happens with somebody's money, they go investigate, they audit, and if you use their money for something else, you could lose your license. So a broker that uses the, the client's money could lose their license. And that's called commingling. We're going to go over that in a second. Now it says there's no need to keep a separate account for each transaction, but careful books must be kept. So it's always clear how much money belongs to each client or customer. It says the account must be clearly labeled so that it cannot be claimed by creditors in the event of bankruptcy or heirs at broker's death. So it's very simple. Because it's not my money, if I go bankrupt, the, the creditors like Bank of America, Chase, whatever, they cannot touch that money. They cannot levy that account. That account belongs to you, the buyer, or whatever money belongs to you, the buyer. Does that make sense? Yeah. So they cannot touch it separately. If I die and my heirs want to, to get the money from the business, they can't get the money from the business, but not from the escrow account because it belongs to somebody else. Okay? It says brokers are required to deposit funds uh, coming into their keeping promptly, which the commission defined as within five business days of acceptance, underlying five business. Double underlying business, triple underlying, circle, it's card, bubbles, whatever you want. But business days. So here's the question. If I give you, I'm the buyer, and I give you money on the Thursday, a deposit, give you money on Thursday. And you know what? It's Thursday, and you're not going to see your broker. Friday comes along, you went out party for the weekend, whatever, and you don't give it to your broker. Comes Monday, you give the money to your broker. When does the broker have to deposit that money? Thursday. By Thursday? 
Wednesday? Wednesday. Yeah. Wednesday. Yeah. Wednesday? Okay. Why? Why Wednesday? Because Thursday counts as, as the first business day. Right. So here's the thing. If the question said evening, it's beyond business hours, you would be correct. Okay. Because, because it was given to me, or it was given to you on a Thursday, usually we assume that it's within business days, right? Within the business day, the hours. So therefore, it starts counting the Thursday. Friday, Monday, Tuesday, mm -hmm. Wednesday. Now, the tricky part where most people fail is that I said I gave to you, and then you get to your broker on Thursday. Uh, I'm sorry, on Monday. So most, most people think, well, Monday, Tuesday, and so on. See, notice the agent is notice the principal. So if you receive any monies as a salesperson, then it's deemed that the broker received it as well. Even though you didn't deliver, the broker received it. Does that make sense? So start counting from the moment you receive. It says right there, salesperson should immediately give any escrow monies they receive to their broker. Okay? And then brokers are specifically prohibited from commingling or mixing their own funds with the money in the trust account. Okay? Um, what if we don't close? I gave you the deposit money and we didn't close. And what happens to that money? It's on a separate account, the escrow account. What happens to that money? And it either goes back to you or it goes to the banks. Okay, so I gave you $10,000 cash on Thursday, mm -hmm. right? You give it to your broker on Monday, which you deposit by Wednesday. And then a month and a half later, a month and a half later, the uh, the deal dies. I gave you $10,000 cash. What must you do with that money? Give it back to me? <laughs> Pay a check. Why? So that you're going to put on right. a uh, right. record. Right. Right. So you cannot give cash back. You cannot take money out of the account and cash it out. You cannot do that. You have to give a check. To receive cash is okay, which I don't recommend at all. Get them to get a money order or something at least. The cash is okay. But you got to give them a written receipt. But to give the money back, it has to be a check made out to that person. Okay, that's on the right hand side on top. It has to be a check made out to that person. Cash deposits or withdrawals. Okay? So they have to deposit it somewhere or exchange somewhere. So now there's a record of transaction. Okay, so it's very simple. If I cash out money and I give to you and I give you a receipt or vice versa, how are we going to prove that you received it? Yeah. But if it, if it's a check, then it's okay. Um, also, if it's ten thousand dollars or more, what must you do? Report it back. I report to Uncle Sam. Mm -hmm. Your favorite uncle wants to know exactly where the money is. That's why you do nine nine nine. I knew I had a scammer somewhere. Okay, so it says uh, permanent records. So every broker must keep records of the trust account activity for at least six years. six years. So in the previous chapter, we talked about six years once. We're going to repeat this a bunch of times. Okay, six years. In chapter 11, we talk about contracts. Six years because you have six years to sue somebody in the contract. So if you screw up a deal, that could haunt you until six years later. If you commit a fraud, it could haunt you until six years later. Six years and one day, fraud is gone, you could do it again. <laughs> Next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> sales contracts. It says every person who signed the listing contract, sales contract, or lease through the meeting receive a duplicate original of the document. What does this really mean? It means you have 10, if there's 10 people buying or selling, there's 10 wet signatures. So we make a bunch of copies of the documents and they sign originals 10 times. You got it? It's not like you sign once and here's a copy of everybody. Mm -hmm. The good news is that today we have e-signature. So we just mail it to them and they sign and they get it. Mm -hmm. Easy. Right? Next paragraph says commissions are negotiable between client and the broker. And no contract can contain anything indicating a prescribed fee schedule. So does anybody know what's the standard commission rate in New Jersey? 2.3? Oh, 3%. 3%. Okay. 6%. 6%. That's the standard? Five and six. I just read commissions are negotiable. And you're telling me six? Really? What kind of realtor are you? He's a salesperson. He's a salesperson. Alright, but three percent? I'll never work with you. Ever. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. It's negotiable. So if I want to charge 10% commission,
commission on the listing, I'll charge 10% commission on the listing. As long as the, the seller agrees, we're good. If I want to charge 1% on the listing, as long as my broker agrees, because <laughs> I'll be fired before you even start the movie. Yeah. So there's no more time to spend training clients. I'm sorry? There's no more time to spend training clients. He's out of here. You will not be able to do <laughs> I start my negotiations at 10. Oh, do you? Okay, John, what do you start at? Yeah. You start at 10 because it's a negotiation. I'll let them both start going here. <laughs> Listen, it's a negotiation. It means you start high and they bring you down. So you start 15, then go on 10. You want 100%? Charge 100%. <laughs> the thing is, Fine. most people, when you say 6%, you say 6%, they're like, oh, but can't you do 5 or 4? I mean, the guy next door is doing 5 or 4. Okay, you want to work with an average realtor? Go work with them. That's the average rate out there, so work with them. Yeah. If you guys feel average, charge average rates. If you guys feel exceptional, then up oh, the rates. Make sense? I think so. That's it. Know your worth. That's what I tell hundreds of my students all the time. You're worth 5%? I mean, do you have a job? Oh, I have a real business. No, you have your own business, but you got a job. Yeah, yeah. You got a job. It's worth. You got a job. I don't want to know how much you get paid. But whatever you get paid by now is what your boss thought you were worth. And worse than that is what you thought you were worth. Because you accepted it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. In real estate, or insurance, or anything, anything that's independent, your business owner says, no, you make your own worth. If you work harder, you might get paid more. Right? For your boss, whether you work harder or not, you get paid the same. Until you get fired. <laughs> that's a reality. Or live off. It's one or the other. Yeah. Right? So, know your worth. Very important. Next, it says, licensees can prepare sales contracts only for one to four family homes and single building lots. That means that there's a standard contract that was prepared, drafted by attorneys. See, there's a bunch of one to four family houses out there, right? So it's easy. You just keep the standard. What if it's a five family? Is that a normal house to see out there? A six family? Seven, eight, that's too much or not? So anything that's out of the ordinary, that's not common, you have to prepare what's called a letter of intent. Make sure you circle letter of intent. And that's all you do. If the letter of intent is accepted, then attorneys draft contracts. You don't get involved anymore. That's why commercial sometimes is easier than, than uh, residential. <laughs> yeah. All right, next page. This down on 15 pages at the same time. All right. Next page says, um, the second paragraph says, commission requires that all sales contracts prepared by licensees contain an attorney review clause. And this gives the buyer and seller the right to consult an attorney who may disapprove a contract within three business days. Circle business again. So what we're seeing here is that once you prepare a contract, it goes to attorneys, right? Attorneys review it, and within those three business days, they're entitled to say, we disagree, and it doesn't move forward. But when do the three business days start counting? It says, after delivery of signed contract to both parties, Right, this is something that people don't understand either. I give, give an offer to you, the seller, and until I get a signed offer, uh, a signed offer back to me, I don't know if you really accept it. So until I get the signed from you, it doesn't start counting. If you take three days to give it back to me, then start counting after the third day. But what starts counting is the right to attorney review. So that means attorney review has to start within the three business days. A lot of people, a lot of realtors think, no, no, no. Three business days and we should be done and go to closing. No, that's when it starts. If no disputes are done within the three business days, then the contract stands as it is. But if review starts within the three the dispute starts within three business days, it could take another week. It could take a month. I had a month and a half once. Remember the that puppy? Month and a half. I said never again will I deal with this is for realtors. Uh, I never again will I deal with litigation attorney. Because litigation attorneys they spend most of their time in uh, court, mm -hmm. they don't have time for your deal. So it's just another hint for you guys, once you become uh, salespeople, is, is you're gonna use a uh, real estate attorney. That's all they do. So everything is quick, okay? Um, next paragraph, it says, all written offers must be forwarded to sellers within 24 hours. And at the time of listing, owners of the property must be furnished with a copy of the attorney general memorandum regarding the attorney law against discrimination. So how long do you have to submit offers? 
put out one. Group. How long we have to submit offers? Six. Oh. How long do you have to submit offers? Six hours. Oh. <laughs> you guys cannot read. It's written by there. Okay. It's written by there. It's written by there. <laughs> How long do you have to submit offers? So in the state exam, there's going to be four answers always. Two are very similar, and two are completely wrong. One of them is going to say all offers within 24 hours. The other one's going to say written offers. I just said it's written. Yeah. I did. Uh, written offers. Written. See, you're telling me that you have a buyer for my client, right? The house is listed for 100000 and you show up with a client that wants a million dollars. I'll pay a million dollars for that house. And now I go all excited, call my client, say, hey, you got a million dollar offer coming. And it never comes. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So until it's on paper and it's in my hands, it's not a real offer. And that's what they said right here. Written offers must be submitted within 24 hours. Verbal offers, hey, put it in writing. Okay. I wouldn't because I'm in the house because I was the only one that put in a written offer. And there was a bunch of verbal. There you go. <laughs> All right. So always put it in writing. Mm -hmm. It's like that Beyonce song. <laughs> Instead of putting the thing, you put the offer. <laughs> Um, all right, the Georgia Supreme Court has ruled that buyers and sellers of residential real estate may choose whether or not to incur the cost of hiring a lawyer. What it means, a, uh, all right, so what this means is simple. As of 1988, New Jersey says we cannot force buyers or sellers to use an attorney. So until then, you have to use an attorney. Like in New York, you force you to have an attorney. In New Jersey, you can't. You can't force anybody. So if you put an offer and you want to be represented by an attorney, it's totally fine. It's at your own risk. So we suggest that you have one, but it's at your own risk if you don't want one. Okay? Um, they actually can't say work. Or you said at your own risk. It says what? They actually use exactly what you said, at your own risk. Exactly what I said, like those words, like those. In the state exam? Wow. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all the way at the bottom. Check out what I just said. Where it says other documents? You see it? <laughs> it says the broker must keep copies of all unaccepted offers to purchase for six months from the date of the initial offer. So, how long must he keep the offers? Unaccepted ones for six months. Thank you. Unaccepted offers keep for six months. Because if they were accepted, they became contracts, which is the next sentence. It says copies of contracts must be kept for six years. Anything that's permanent records of the transaction must be kept for six months. Unaccepted offers, they're not permanent. But why would you keep offers for six months? Because what if you want to really go back on it? Or yeah, what if the deal falls through? You have to back up off. Mm -hmm. What if somebody decides to sue you because they thought there was discrimination involved? Now you can prove all the offers, hey, it has nothing to do with discrimination, it's just that theirs was better. Yeah. Okay. Um, it says broker business relationship. Let's go to the right hand side. It says listing broker and seller as a principal. I'm going to go briefly over this because tomorrow, chapter three, goes in depth when it comes to the broker and um, principal. So it says brokers are bound to specific duties to their principal. Their obligation, so the broker's obligation, and yours, salespeople, because you represent the broker, their obligation is to put their principal's interest first, however, still requires fair and honest dealing with other parties. What we're saying here is, it's not about the commission, it's about your client. Your client is your principal, so it's their interest first, right? And a lot of realtors, unfortunately, is just the name of the game, a lot of realtors are like, oh, I can make more commission if I do it this way, versus here's what my client wants, I'm going to lose. But here's what my client wants, right? Um, the second paragraph says, to give sellers the best service possible, the commission expects brokers to cooperate with other firms that may want to show this with property. Anytime a seller directs a broker not to cooperate, the licensee would have the seller sign a waiver of broker cooperation form. I'm not going to read it, but what we're saying is, if I'm the seller and you guys are three months, I'm going to tell you, the salesperson, I'm going to tell you, listen, 
I like you, and I like your team. Don't show this to anybody else. Just keep it in house. So that means that you got to work with your own buyers to show my house, right? If I don't sign an agreement that says I understand that working with other brokers like a white rate, seventy twenty one, and so on, will bring more buyers, will probably help me sell the house faster and for a higher price. If I don't sign that, acknowledging that I might lose a lot of money by working just for you guys, then this is not valid. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I must acknowledge. You must tell me, or Bruno, if you really want to do this, I need you to sign this. You understand? Does that make sense? Yeah. Because working with other brokers, see how many people do you know that are interested in buying or selling? A lot. How many? 10, 20, 10? A lot. 10? To me, that's all. 10. How many people do you think you know? I'm going to be honest. No, the two no. Do you want to buy? No, no. Do you want to buy or something? I don't want to buy. I don't want to sell. I don't have to sell. You want to buy. That's one. Okay. You probably know two or more people, two or three more people. So that's be 10 per person, as an example. Right? How many people we have here? 10, 20, 30, right? 40, 50, 60 people that will probably look at my house. But if I work with a white group that has 100 agents there, as an example, then I have way more people. And that's what we're saying. Keep it in house, you're limiting the exposure to 10, right? Per person. And those 10, do they really want my house? Maybe one of those 10 might want my house. So now we're limited to six people that are going to see my house. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But if you work with others, and that's what we're saying here, if you work with other companies, you have greater exposure. You might get the house seen faster, sold for a higher price, right? And not get it affected. The next paper says um, broker and buyer as a principal. Again, we're going to talk about that tomorrow. But broker and buyer principle just says, again, even if you represent the buyer, it's the buyer's interest first, then yours. Broker as a disclosable agent. What we're saying as a disclosable agent means we represent both parties. We represent the seller, we represent the buyer. Don't you think that's risky? Hmm? Isn't it risky when you represent both? Because representing the seller, that's the seller's it's main interest first. If you represent the buyer, then it's the buyer's interest first. If you represent both, then whose interests are you representing? My own, right? So that's why I disclose the agent, you're telling them, hey, I represent both of you, maybe you should hire an attorney to represent your own, right? I cannot make the price higher because I represent the seller, or make the price lower because I represent the buyer, I'm in between, okay? And then there's transaction broker. Transaction broker says right there, Licensees, second sentence, licensees in New Jersey have the option of functioning as a transaction broker without creating an agency relationship with any of the parties. As a transaction broker, what we're saying is, I don't represent you, I don't represent you, I represent the transaction itself. Meaning, I don't have to be loyal to you or to, or, or to him or her, but I'll do the best to get this transaction done. That's pretty much it. Okay, I'll explain all, all those tomorrow clearly. Broken salesperson. Any questions so far? No? All right, so broker and salesperson. Before you start working anywhere, what's the first question you ask? Any job in the business. What is it? How much you pay? It doesn't matter what you're going to do, it's how much you pay. Yeah? So I pay you. <laughs> I'll pay you 100. <laughs> everything has a price, so I'll pay you $100,000 a year. Ah, so now you care about what you're going to do. Of course. So why the first question is the pay? Sure you want. All right. Exactly. Well, in this case, you already know the job. So, yes, the first question I ask you how much you make. So, <laughs> the contract, the contract before you start, must specifically state your compensation, whether it's a percentage, a salary, or a split of both. It also must state that you're going to get paid within 10 days, 10 days right there, underline 10 days, after the commission is received or as soon as the check is cleared. When is commission received? Closing. At closing. So you know, does anybody still use world calendars? Yeah. You, you do? Okay. The rest of us are kind of okay. So, <laughs> so here's the thing. Use a world calendar, you can put it next 10 days later. Yeah. Calendar days. You can put it next. I'm getting paid. Yeah. All right. And in between is the already spent the money. Okay. Because <laughs> that happens all the time, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm just waiting for it. Waiting for that. The pro, 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 pro. And my ex is paid the pro part, but it's still broke. All right. Just that a majority of people, I'm going to get paid. You already spent the money. Right. Um, and then there's the third bullet point here. I call this the prenup. You guys know what a prenup is? Mm -hmm. What is a prenup? It's basically what's mine is mine, what's yours is yours. Nope. I actually have nothing to do with that. Really? Yeah. A prenup can also say we're putting it all together. It's just an agreement. A prenup is before we get married, it's saying, hey, if we get divorced. Mm -hmm. That's all it says. If we get divorced, how are we going to split? Are we putting it all together? Are we splitting? Whatever we have before stays, and then when we acquire together goes. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's just that before that, we're simplifying the divorce. In this case, I'm telling you, if you ever leave our office, this is how much I'm going to pay you. See, in the first bullet point, we declared that your commission is going to be 70% of every deal. That's an example. But when you leave, your commission is 25% of whatever is left behind. But you know up front that you're not taking everything when you leave the force. You got it? So I call it the prenup clause because of that. Okay. And finally, any changes to be made to the contracts must be acknowledged by both and signed by both parties. Um, where it says after finding? Okay, it's the same. Where it says after finding? Yes, you went from cameraman to robot. Hey, the motor man. <laughs> he said boy, I don't know. Come on, man. You know you talk boy. <laughs> um, so where it says advertisement, it says New Jersey Real Estate Commission has regulations regarding any advertisement offering to sell, thing, to sell by exchange or rent through property. And it says that these regulations are intended to let the public know exactly what these are doing. Because they're. Don't do that. <laughs> To let them know exactly with whom they're doing. Because it's very important that when you advertise, do you have your business card? Do you have your business card, please? It's very important that when you advertise, people know exactly who you are, right? But it's not you that matters, sorry. It's not him, right? He's an agent for a company. It's this that matters. So when he advertises anything, this is a form of advertisement. People must know who they can sue in case this guy sues them. Does that make sense? Yeah. So these are intended to know exactly with whom they're dealing. They're dealing with a loan officer and with the company, the mortgage company. So, so it says right here that the regulation covers all media. This is a question, possible question for the exam. Well, it used to be. Uh, all media, including publications, broadcasts, stationery, business cards, email, web pages. And that includes also social media, by the way. So if you advertise on Facebook, it cannot be you because you don't represent yourself. You represent a company. Okay? So there, you're going to see a lot of agents out there have their page that says, Bruno sells homes. Right? Or look at my listings. That's incorrect and that's an open door to get sued. It's your company's listings. And it's not Bruno sells homes. It's Bruno sells homes with. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Uh, so it says, uh, real estate listings today are reproduced on websites by local newspapers, classified as apartments, individual salespersons, brokers, both when written on MLS sites, and national sites like Realtor.com. It also says, all ads must indicate the broker's business name, followed by the terms such as realtor, realtist, real estate broker, or real estate agency. And the licensee's name must be exactly, appear exactly as it is on the license, with exception of any middle name or initial, which may not be used, but a nickname may be added. It repeats the same thing for uh, the salesperson. Here's the thing. Some people have weird names. It's just the way it is. If you, when you sit down to take the exam at, at PS High, when they sit down, they ask you to review everything. And sometimes there's students that are all excited just to get in, just get it over with, that they don't read. And I had a particular case. Um, his name is Edwards. And he went to take the exam, he did not pay attention. His name was written at the E. So you know how the C sometimes looks like an E? Right? You go, you go like this to do a C, and it kind of looks like an E, right? And that's how the person took it. Whoever was entering in the system, they took it as an E. So he became Edwin E versus Edwards. 
Here's the thing, he did not notice the difference. He took the exam, all excited, sent me a picture of the score report. I passed three times later. Here's all. So he says, I passed. Thank you so much. And I'm like, because I'm no idiot. I look at all the details. <laughs> Isn't that what you get from me? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm like, congratulations. By the way, is that your name? He didn't even realize. He was so excited. He didn't even realize the wrong name was there. Guess what? It took him three or four months, three or four months to be able to clear the name of the real estate commission. During those three or four months, he had to advertise his name as Edwin Luckily, everybody calls him Ed. So they allow nicknames. Mm -hmm. So they allow his name to be. So Edwin Yee, as it was in the. Something like that. Edwin Yee, and then Ed, and then his last name, which I don't know. But anyway, so they allowed Ed to be there, and everybody got to know him as Ed. If there was a lawsuit in between that started during those months, they would sue this guy. And now there's an additional lawsuit for misrepresentation because that's not his real name. Mm -hmm. You got it? So make sure when you sit down to take the exam, you go through everything calmly. That's why they ask you 30 minutes before to review all the information. Next page. This is on camera, you're assuming they're using this now. <laughs> I already told them several times. I use you guys scenarios, by the way. As things happen to you guys, I usually use it in class. Makes it easier. Especially when I take pictures and I say, hey, this is the guy. It's good. All right. Um, this is a potential question in the city exam. It says, all ads must specify the property's municipal location. Specifically named in the ad, or at the head of the column in which the ad appears. And such phrases as in the vicinity of are prohibited unless the body of the ad also contains the exact municipal location. What does this mean? Do you guys know what a newspaper is? Mm -hmm. Okay. You still read my you still exist. You still read classified? No way. But if you were to advertise in classified or online classified, you would know that there's a union column and then there's there's a for sale, there's for rent, and so on, right? In this advertisement here that says for sale, I don't have to repeat union. I can do the advertisement saying uh, two bed and three bath because we have problems at home. So two bed and three bath is available for whatever price if I want to. But I don't have to repeat union because it's already even under union. So what a lot of people do is use like Let's say we're in the room. Yeah, for the advertisement. We're in the room. And the property's located near Urban Tree. A lot of people might not want to look at it because it's located near Urban Tree. But because it's located near Urban Tree, it's also located near Elizabeth or Nibor or any of I'm going to use the surrounding towns in the vicinity of, but without disclosing where it's really located. So I'm using another town to give value to my property. That is illegal. If I don't disclose the municipal location, or seeing that bunch of things, uh, okay. <laughs> so if I don't disclose the municipal location, that is illegal because people have to know, especially which side of Newark it is. Yeah. All right, you got to know that. Makes a huge difference, mm -hmm. especially when you sh you show the property at one particular time when there's no problems, and then they move in and like, oh, during the day during the snow, during the snow. Yeah. 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 Especially in Newark, you never notice the potholes because it's Newark covering. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to say anything bad on camera. Mm. Alright. Uh, in the fourth paragraph, it says an ad may not discriminate promise financing. Did you? An ad may not discriminate promise financing. So all loan terms must contain the words to qualify buyer. Any sums mentioned in the terms of payments or financing must be qualified by the word approximate or estimated. So you've all seen or, or heard on the radio, they say, hey, buy this car, it's only $200 a month, or whatever it is, right? And at the end, they will I don't know if we're all by life. Right? Really fast. Mm -hmm. Or on TV, 
everything is really big. In word, find this, right? And then really tiny letters that even, like I've been increasing my TV size for so long and I still cannot read it. I'm getting bigger TVs and bigger TVs and still cannot read the, those, those letters to a qualified buyer. So your advertising must contain it. They just don't say the size. <laughs> People cannot read the font. Isn't that how you do it? The tiniest font possible? No, not the tiniest. It's slightly smaller. You have to slightly smaller. So I have to read this font stuff, even on big. Yeah. Like the first thing is it. You use a magnifying glass? No, because I have a big mistake. Anybody else have a TV here? Is it 4K or ultra 4K? I don't know, man. It's one of these massive things, so it's there, I don't know. Man, I'm going to go for the ultra one. She must be that. No, I don't know. <laughs> it almost feels like those um, pill advertisements. You, you're depressed? I'll take this. And at the end, you're like, by the way, you might die. Yeah. 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 The side effects. It just had headaches, man. <laughs> <laughs> it was a headache. It was a depression pill. <laughs> so, advertising is very important because you do it with consumers. Um, The next one says no advertising or sign indicate the property sold until the sale has closed and title ownership has been transferred. This happens a lot. As soon as it's under contract, people run with sold. Wait, it didn't sell yet. It didn't close yet. Right? It's under contract. That's a different thing. But they, and they even talk about it. I can always see them realtors and say, hey, I sold this. And then three months later, yeah, the deal fell through. Like, what do you mean? You sold it? Or you still fell through? So it was under contract. Okay, you have to mm -hmm. be careful there. Um, can you offer a free service? Uh, or item must be generally free and cannot be contingent upon any purchase or listing of the property. A free offer cannot be linked to a lottery, contest, game, or drawing. So usually what I say is people do, I know it's on the test, people do open houses, right, as an example. And they give some type of incentive. One of them is free beverages, right, or refreshments, and maybe you have um, donuts. As an example, right? See, if I want to walk in, I'm giving you a hint if you're ever hungry. If I want to walk in, grab a donut, grab a coffee, and walk out, I can. You cannot force me to sign in. You cannot force me to buy in order to get that donut or the coffee. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's generally free, it's there, available. There's a lot of realtors that force people to sign in. No, no, you have to. No, no, you can say, hey, would you like to sign in? You cannot force people to do it, okay? Um, if you guys really want to take like your significant other out, there's something called Brokers Open House. They have uh, lobster, they have champagne. You know, it's a nice oh, night out. <laughs> hey, it's taking them out because you're going to somebody else's house. Maybe it's free. It's free. Bring the camera. Bring the camera. You walk in with the camera. That's it. All right. Um, Next, it says advertising that offers free appraisals. We've never mentioned this three times in the book. Anything that offers free appraisals is also prohibited, although offering a comparative market analysis or CMA is permissible. See, appraisals are done by appraisers. We are not appraisers. What we can offer is comps, comparables. That is okay. So we offer free estimates or, or free valuations, but we cannot offer appraisals, free appraisals. Okay? And that was on? Yes. Yes. All the way at the bottom it says uh, any advertisement that mentions a specific commission rate or amount must also state that in New Jersey commissions are six percent. You can say it. Yeah, I'm like, wait, where does that say? <laughs> Your book does not say six percent. No. Well, what does it say? It's unnegotiable. Underline, put stars, put bubbles, whatever you gotta put. It's negotiable. There's no six percent. Yeah, you saw that at the beginning of everybody knows. Commission rebates. You guys remember I talked about rebates before? Mm -hmm. Who can you give rebates to? Who can you give money to? In the real estate transaction. Somebody that's unlicensed. Buyer. The buyer only. So commission rebates, these rights to a buyer. To a buyer. Okay. And again, I have it highlighted just to remember, remind you guys you cannot be comparing a lottery game contest or anything like that. You're either offering or you're not. Okay. 
Then you have probation, suspension, and revocation. You see? Mm -hmm. So it says the commission may investigate complaints against the act of licensees or investigate on its own. You may place a licensee on probation, suspend a license, or revoke the license. In addition, fines for violations shall not be less than $250, nor more than $50,000. And that was one test. test. So here's the thing, procedure. And this applies to insurance as well. And you guys ever take insurance license? Maybe, maybe more of I'm not sure. But at least for the insurance, it says, before suspending or revoking uh, the license, the commission gives the licensee at least 10 days of advance notice of the hearing. So underline 10 days. It's 10 days for you to plead. It's 10 days for you to plead your case. For you to show up in front of them and say, I'm sorry, I did not know where I made a mistake, whatever, and appeal to them to reduce the sentence or actually get rid of the sentence. Does that make sense? So if you're about to get suspended, say it's the fourth, and so March 15th, you get suspended. You got until tomorrow to show up in front of the real estate commission. Okay? After that, that's it. Whatever they decide, whatever they rule, it is what it is. The next page. It says, when a salesperson is disciplined, the broker, um, the broker's license may or may not be affected, depending on whether or not they have guilty knowledge. What is guilty knowledge? That means the broker knew what was going on and did nothing to stop it. So let's say he's my top producer, but for the past ten years he's been my top producer. So you know what? I let a few things slide. For instance, contracts. Every single contract he brings is missing a signature or initials. And every single time he tells me, Bruno, don't worry, the buyer is right outside, I'm going to go to the parking lot, get the sign, and come right back in. For 10 years, the buyer is right outside. How many times are you going to buy this lawyer? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Who goes to the buyer? Every time the buyer is right outside. That's what you do always. Until the contract is. Yeah. Leave the Never office. leave the office. Stay near the parking lot until I can come back. Right. So what do you think he's doing in the meantime? Forging signatures. Forging signatures. As a broker, I should have known better. And I should have said, hey, listen, you got to stop this. Either you bring a complete file or get out. I cannot work with you like this. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So one day, the deal does not go through and the buyer goes, hey, let me see the paperwork. He says, wait a minute, that's not my signature. So now that buyer is going to sue him and sue me as the broker. If they can prove that I had guilty knowledge and I knew this was going on, he loses his license, I lose my license. And if you guys all work for me, what happens to your license? Same thing, get suspended. So it says right here, when broker's licenses are suspended or revoked, their salesperson's licenses are suspended until the end, <laughs> until the end of the current license period. So <laughs> there might be a question that has two answers that are very similar. One answer is this exactly, which is the correct answer. And the other one is during that time, salespersons are free to affiliate with another broker and can obtain a reissued license at no charge. So what's the difference here? Both of these are kind of valid. The problem is for the real estate commission and for the state exam, it's the most applicable answer that's valid. So what's the immediate consequence if the broker is found guilty or if the salesperson is found guilty? What's the immediate consequence? Suspension. suspension. All right. Yeah, during that time you can affiliate with somebody else, but the immediate consequence is suspension. So that's the correct answer. Okay. So there's again two very similar answers that could say, "Oh, this is what it is," but no, it's what's the immediate consequence? You lose your license. Okay. And you're still going to have to prove you have nothing to do with it. What? That's the question. Of the immediate consequence. Mm -hmm. They can have court for another well, you're gonna have to prove you have nothing to, to do with that. But usually during the, the investigation, they'll release the liability of you. It's, it's just these two people were found guilty, the salesperson and the broker. Everybody else is released. It's just that since you don't have a sponsoring broker because they lost your license, all your licenses become uh, suspended. Therefore, you have to find another broker during that time. And because you're not guilty of it, they don't charge you to associate with another broker. Okay? All right, everything else is violations. We covered already most of them. Are we going to cover along the way? 